I think many of us are moving away from chemoimmunotherapy in the unmutated mm -hmm. group, but to be fair, I, I, you know, I think that, that it also is a patient preference issue, as Steve was saying, with regards to, you know, types of therapy, how long, duration of therapy, do they want to be on, I mean, obviously the, the, we're going to discuss lots of therapies where we're looking at truncating therapy, but for now patients are staying on a brood nib theoretically until they progress or they have a toxicity. So having that conversation, they, they may still preferentially decide, you know, that versus that. Um, but I think in general, I agree with Steve about the unmutated IGBH. Maybe you can also comment on the Germans have done work mm -hmm. in terms of categorizing patients mm -hmm. as these go-go, yeah. fit patients, yeah. slow-go, or the no-go patient yeah. population. They've also used a comorbidity index in their, uh, in their trials for inclusion criteria. So are those, th are those things useful? Do we use our clinical judgment when assessing or is, are, there, are there objective parameters that we're using now yeah, I mean, to direct I, I think we do something similar in the U.S. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, we're looking at their comorbidities very similarly. We're looking at, I mean, they formalized it in the studies that they ran, but you know, we're looking at their renal function and their other medical problems, uh, coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension, and so on and so forth. So when choosing particular therapies, um, you're going to be choosing those therapies based on the comorbidities of your patients and what their renal function is. Um, so I think that's very similar. And obviously doing that, you know, date, you know, we have data showing that clearly some of the therapies that we've given, as Steve pointed out, the median age being in the mid 70s, 72, you know, some of the therapies that are very active just may not be very tolerable in our older patient population with these comorbidities. So you lose that benefit of the efficacy in a very, you know, myelosuppressive regimen per se. So you're picking based on their comorbidities. Obviously, the TKIs have shifted that a little bit, right? Because now you can give a brutinib to all comers, um, and albeit it does have side effects that I'm sure we're going to discuss, it's still more manageable than chemo immunotherapy, and so all can actually benefit from a TKI. Um, so you're going to discuss whether or not patients want to stay on indefinite, at least right now, so oral therapy versus depending upon their prognostic markers, chemo immunotherapy. So, um, but I think we do something similar, <laughs> just in more, we just base it on, as Steve said, our clinical experience, our judgment, the comorbidities of our patients' renal function. Um, Dr. Ma, the, the FISH results in using 17P has, is already in the guidelines that we use, um, NCCN, for example, uh, to direct therapy. Mutation status, immunoglobulin, heavy chain, VG mutation status hasn't made it into, that, into those guidelines. Do you think it's time that we should have the discussion and bring those, that factor into, into, the, into the algorithms that are developed as guidelines for therapy? Yes, I think that will be very helpful. Uh, that will help with the reimbursement. But from the necessity point of view, uh, based on uh, the uh, analysis of uh, several very large randomized studies, uh, for example, from the CLO8 uh, study and CLO10 study, uh, and also from the novel therapy uh, point of view, the IGBH mutated versus unmutated patient do uh, have really different outcome. And the IGBH mutated patients seem to benefit the most from the uh, immunochemotherapy. So data from uh, your center, MD Anderson, and also from the CLL8 study definitely show that uh, for young fit patient with IGBH mutated status, uh, there seem to be a plateau after a number of years. Um, so there are a group of patients, almost about 50%, would you say? So those patients seem to have a very prolonged progression-free survival. And there is maybe that potential of cure for those patients. So uh, there are a lot of efforts in trying to um, develop new combinations, trying to reduce the potential toxicity from the FCR and to improve upon the uh, uh, benefit of the efficacy. So I think by making IGVH uh, mutation testing into the NCCN guideline would definitely help to, for us to better guide the patient because it's a very important predictive factor. So speaking of making improvements on what one would, would consider a standard chemoimmunotherapy regimen, FCR, Matt, you presented at this meeting your work with the IFCR uh, regimen. Maybe you can explain to us the rationale for that and what you've seen with the report that you've, that you've presented at this meeting. Sure, so you know, we've been inspired by the long-term uh, results that we've seen with FCR alone from your center and others uh, with these mutated IGHV patients having very durable responses. Um, however, it's not a durable response for all, so even the mutated IGHV patients need improved regimens. Moreover, patients with the unmutated IGHV only had about a 10% progression-free survival long-term, and so we think there's a lot of room for improvement there. So the idea with our study was to add ibrutinib to FCR uh, for a six-month course of combination, followed by two years of ibrutinib maintenance. 
Uh, and although it's a frontline study, uh, we have an early readout which is using the MRD negative status of the patients uh, at the end of the combination. Uh, we've seen very high rates of MRD negativity, which we do think will translate into prolonged progression-free survival for these patients. Uh, so, so far the results of the study look encouraging, but it's still early. It's a 35 patient study so far. Uh, we're expanding it to 85 patients where we'll be able to say something a bit more meaningful. Uh, I can highlight also that in the same session, um, you, your center presented really exciting data for ibrutinib with FCG, GA101, or obinutuzumab, uh, focused on the mutated IGHV patients, and I think that's also a very promising approach. I think, you know, that's a little, su su your results are a little surprising to me because the other thing it seems from the MD Anderson data with FCR is that uh, the mutated patients who achieve MRD negativity are really the ones who are benefiting. And of course, you don't know if you're going to be one of those patients when you start therapy. The mutated patients who don't achieve MRD negativity drop down like everybody else. So, you know, you, you employ a strategy of adding a novel agent. And I wouldn't a priori think that adding a brutinib to FCR is going to get you more MRD negativity. Uh, your preliminary results suggest so. I would think perhaps adding um, uh, obinutuzumab, uh, using obinutuzumab instead might. But so I think it'll be really interesting if those studies continue to see if they do achieve more MRD negativity and if that does translate to prolonged benefit. But you know, these are the MD Anderson studies, the German studies are very mature studies. It's hard to collect uh, that kind of long-term data to really know if this is the way to go. So I, I have a particular interest in minimal residual disease and, and looking at our chemoimmunotherapy regimens and now our non-chemoimmunotherapy regimens, our small molecule inhibitor based. I think one of the early parameters also that will be interesting that there's not a lot of data for is time to MRD relapse. And I mm -hmm. think that will be an, mm -hmm. an, an earlier indicator than waiting for progression-free survival mm -hmm. um, because it does precede clinical progression predictably sure. uh, by at least a couple years. So I think we can collapse down the, the timeline in terms of g gaining useful information in the frontline setting even when we get these deep remissions if we're looking at more sensitive methods for MRD and also looking at MRD uh, time to relapse. But what will that, what will that mean? Okay, it, it means that you will get clinical relapse afterwards and uh, we don't know. It'll be regimen dependent probably on how long that might take. And of course the question you want to know is, well, do I need to do anything about it or are you fine just doing something when you have a reason to treat again? I think that's the crux of it. I mean, developing curative strategies is the approach now for the patients who have a mutated group. So the trial that Matt referred to was the IFCG trial, only enrolled patients who had a mutated V right. gene. So we're looking for MRD relapse um, in that study. We have some baseline data also with regard to FCR in terms of the incidence of MRD relapse. And what is uh, that? A longer term uh, time to MRD relapse. Right. Um, so as I mentioned, it's an earlier indicator um, and the, the, that study, the, the FCR, the historic FCR, where we did all the prognostic factors and prospectively looked at MRD is still maturing. So we're still working on the follow-up from, uh, from that trial. But I do think that MRD relapse is, uh, is a, a potentially important parameter to look at, particularly if we're talking about developing these potentially curative strategies and we're not, we're not wanting to wait for the, these long follow-up times that we need to monitor patients for in the frontline setting. Well, it sounds like it would be more helpful to tell you that you're actually not curing patients. That, right. yeah, right. I mean, it's, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What I really like about the IFCG study uh, is the shortened duration of FCR. So, uh, you know, we, we know that FCR can give some patient a very long uh, duration response, but the problem is there's always the concern of the 5% of patients who may develop uh, secondary malignancies in the marrow, such as MDS or acute myeloid leukemia. So uh, if we can use some strategy to improve the efficacy, but at the same time trying to reduce the potential long-term toxicity, I think that strategy is really appealing. So that's why I really like the design of uh, your study, the uh, IFCG, which you only utilize three cycles of F uh, FCR, sorry, FCG combined with abrutinib, and then, uh, and then it's a MRD uh, tailored 
approach after that. So if patients are MRD negative, so MRD negativity is your kind of a endpoint for treatments. So you can use a continued combination of uh, ibrutinib with G with the uh, albinotuzumab um, to achieve the MRD negative status uh, or use a, a prolonged use of ibrutinib. So MRD tailored approach with a shortened duration of chemotherapy, I think is really the way to go.